Welcome to the Launchpad News from our TLP Canada studio, bringing you the latest in the world of space exploration. My name is Zach Aubert. We're glad to have you joining us today. Our first story takes us out to China for the historic launch of Land Space's Zuka 2 rocket. Land Space, a private Chinese space company, has made history launching the first Methalox rocket to orbit. The Methalox space race, fueled by development for reusable rockets powered by methane and liquid oxygen, has seen competition between SpaceX's Starship, United Launch Alliance Vulcan Centaur, and Land Space's Zuka 2. All phases of the Zuka 2 launch were nominal, carrying the telecommunication satellite into a confirmed orbit, but shortly after engine cutoff and orbit confirmation, the vehicle began to spin, leading to an expected loss of the vehicle. Though the payload may have been lost, this launch is considered success, as for the first time in history, a Methalox rocket has made it to orbit, proving that this is possible. The Zuka 2 launch marks another significant milestone in the step forward for the Chinese commercial space industry and further pushes the space race of Methalox rockets to prove that they are usable. Well, India is headed back to the moon early this morning Eastern Time. The Indian Space Research Organization, or ISRO, or ISRO, successfully launched the Chandrayaan-3 mission. Chandrayaan-3 consists of a lunar orbiter, lander, and rover, and is a follow-up to the Chandrayaan-2 mission, which, despite an unfortunate landing failure, still provided valuable insight and data about the lunar surface. Chandrayaan-3 is designed to rectify the technical challenges faced by Chandrayaan-2 and further India's lunar exploration goals. Chandrayaan-3 carries a six-wheeled rover that weighs about 20 kilograms and has a battery that holds a charge for about two weeks, but it does power via solar. It will move around the landing site performing the lunar surface chemical analysis and relay data back to Earth through the lunar orbiter. The lunar lander will be collecting data on moon quakes, thermal properties of the lunar surface, the density and variation of lunar surface plasma. Altogether, Chandrayaan 3's mission will collect scientific information on lunar topography, mineralogy, elemental abundance, lunar exosphere, and signatures of hydroxyl and water ice. Now shifting our focus to the United States for the next few stories, it was an exciting week out at NASA Kennedy Space Center as NASA received the Artemis Crew Transportation Vehicles. This fleet of specially designed vehicles by Canoe Technologies will transport astronauts on their final leg of their journey to the moon on Earth from crew quarters out to Launch Complex 39B. These cutting-edge electric vehicles have been meticulously tailored to meet NASA's unique specifications for the Artemis missions while also paying tribute to the agency's rich legacy in human spaceflight and space exploration. They have been designed to transport astronauts to and from the pad of SLS rockets and have undergone rigorous testing and are now ready to play a memorial a memorial and are now ready for their important role of the NASA's ambitious plans to return humans to the lunar surface by 2024 ish just as Astrovans did for Apollo. Artemis Launch Director Charlie Blackwell Thompson said in a statement about the arrival that the collaboration between Canoe and our NASA representatives focused on the crew's safety and comfort on the way to the pad ahead of their journey to the moon. I have no doubt everyone who sees the new vehicles will feel the same pride I have for this next endeavor of crewed Artemis missions. This delivery brings us one step closer, returning humanity to the lunar surface, and you can follow along as we count down to Artemis 2 II and 3 right here on the launch pad. Now before we continue with the news, we want to take a quick moment and thank all of our incredible TLP members. Your generous support helps us continue to upgrade our equipment, expand our team, and dream of new ways to bring you the best possible coverage of everything space from around the world. Starting this month, we're rolling out new live streams, member-only streams, early video access, and more. So make sure you've joined the TLP Discord and linked your YouTube accounts so you can go behind the scenes here at TLP Network. If you're interested in becoming a TLP member, you can hit that join button down below starting at just 99 cents a month. You too can help us inform and inspire the next generation. Now, unfortunately, not all news is always positive. NASA recently had to cancel their Janus mission following the launch postponement of Psyche. Originally intended as a ride-along mission on the Psyche mission in 2022, Janus was designed to study two separate binary asteroid systems. However, due to the new October 2023 launch period for Psyche, it became clear that the two spacecraft would not be able to reach their intended targets. After a careful consideration of opportunities and requirements, and the expected funds and resources for a new mission, NASA has decided to halt further work on the Janus mission. 
They have instructed the project team to focus on completing the remaining contracted work on the two spacecraft before preparing them for long-term storage. This does allow for the possibility that one day we will see these spacecraft emerge for a future mission if funding becomes available. Now, while the cancellation is disappointing, it continues to highlight the complexity of space exploration and the importance of thorough preparations and successful missions. While cancellations can be disappointing, it highlights the complexity of space exploration and the importance of thorough preparation and financial support for these missions. Now, planning a mission, building spacecrafts, launching rockets, and operating a mission isn't cheap, and every year NASA submits a budget request to the U.S. House and Senate. Well, the appropriation committees have met and reviewed NASA's 2024 budget request, and it's not looking like great news. The House and Senate Appropriation Committees are considering cuts to NASA's budget for the upcoming fiscal year. These potential budget reductions are part of a broader agreement reached at the end of May to raise the debt ceiling of the United States while capping non-defense discretionary funding at 2023 levels for the 2024 fiscal year, which sadly affects NASA. While the full text of the Senate bill has yet to be released, a committee summary revealed that the proposed $25 billion for NASA, this amount is lower than the $25.384 billion allotted to the agency this year and significantly lower than the over $27 billion requested by NASA for 2024. At the same time, the House Appropriations released their CJS spending bill for 2024 as well, and that bill proposes $25.367 billion for NASA, slightly below what they were allotted for this year and also significantly lower than what they requested for 2024. These budget cuts raise concerns about the agency's ability to sustain ongoing programs and initiatives and potentially may lead to delays or even further mission cancellations. A lot of people are watching what's going to happen with the Mars return sample mission funding. As further details emerge and bills undergo review and consideration, we'll bring you updates about the finances of NASA over at TLPnetwork.com. Well, the James Webb Space Telescope is one year old in its science operations. Providing a groundbreaking insight into our universe, James Webb has provided some of the most detailed pictures expanding our universe. NASA released this new picture of a small cloud complex where stars are being formed to mark the one year anniversary. Our Space Coast reporter Dakota sat down with Dr. Carl Gordon of the James Webb Space Telescope team at John Hopkins University to talk about the first year's anniversary and James Webb's deployment. Let's check it out. Well, thank you, Mr. Gordon, for joining us today. I'm Dakota Walker with the TLP Network, and today we are joined by Carl Gordon, a James Webb Space Telescope astronomer. Uh, Mr. Gordon, we have a few questions, and I know we're uh, short on time, so we're going to hop right into it. Awesome. Um, can you tell us a bit about yourself and your role as a NASA astronomer? Yeah, so uh, I'm Carl Gordon. I'm an astronomer at Space Telescope Science Institute at Johns Hopkins, and that's where we, where Webb is run. This is where we actually run Webb, tell, you know, we tell Webb what to do, we get the data back down, we process it, we distribute it to the astronomical and worldwide community. And uh, so what do I do? I do uh, a lot of uh, stuff on, after we get the data back down, how to turn it into the really nice images, how to remove instrumental signatures and make it, make it look good, but also correct um, from a, a, a science point of view. And then we can use that both for making nice pictures, but also for doing the science and answering questions that we have. Wonderful. Um, I know Webb has had a tremendous year, uh, first year of scientific discovery. Has there been a specific scientific objective or image that has particularly interested you or your team? Oh, there, there are so many. I've, I've been enjoying them all. I mean, everything from uh, the exoplanet spectra that we're getting from the transiting exoplanet work to the highest redshift, most earliest galaxies. Um, my, my area in particular is interstellar matter. Um, so gas and dust that stars form out of, for example. And so I've been interested in uh, a program in Orion, looking at the uh, Orion bar, which is this region lit up, this, this region of gas and dust that's lit up. And we have an incredible amount of information. They're not just nice, pretty pictures, which we love, but also very detailed spectroscopy across this bar to tell us a lot more about the physical properties of the gas and dust in this region. Right, we can really see with spectroscopy all the fingerprints, the signatures of, of various types of gas, as well as the kinds of dust that are there. Oh, absolutely wonderful developments. I know Webb launched on Christmas Day, um, 2021, aboard an Ariane 5. How did you feel about the launch, the commissioning phase, and subsequently when you saw those first images coming into your team? Uh, I was incredibly nervous at launch. To so happy we had such a great launch. 
Um, beautiful launch from the Arian Space Agency. Um, commissioning was, you know, a long six month process as we were starting to try to get, you know, getting the telescope aligned, the telescope aligned, everything deployed, right? The, we all started feeling relief after, as these things went through um, and then starting to get the images down and the data down and seeing when I saw the first image and it looked really good. I was like, yes, it's all gonna work, right? So it, it's an incredible engineering feat, uh, Web is. And it's really a testament to the expertise and knowledge and hard work and dedication of the engineers and scientists who built and then run the web that it's working so well. It was right. It's a it's it's an engineering marvel because there were new things done we've never done before uh, for astronomy. So it's it was it was a lot of relief. And now I'm just loving it. I'm loving all the data we're getting and uh, learning all the science that we can learn. Well, I know we are short on time, so we will keep it short. Um, but with James Webb, we are able to see back into the past, so to speak. Um, and we always like to interview or end our interviews with a question about the next generation. So what would you like to say to the next generation who are looking up to the skies, wondering about our vast universe, the past, the present of the future, and even dreaming about working as an astronomer at NASA? Uh, so it's uh, it's a really fun uh, career to have to be an astronomer. It's a fun thing to do. Um, it, there's an amazing amount of knowledge we still have to gain about our universe. We've, we basically scratched the surface, you know, and, and it's also amazing how much we can learn just by looking out, right? All we're doing is looking out, right? We can maybe get to our solar system bodies and bring samples back, but beyond that's very, very difficult. And so just by looking out and, and seeing what comes in, we can learn an incredible amount of detail about our universe, but also even about fundamental physics. There's knowledge of fundamental physics to be learned um, by doing this. And so it's it's a great deal of fun. It's it's a it's a hard, it's it can be a challenging career to have, right? There, you know, no no career is probably easy, um, but it's also an incredible community to be part of. It's a very small community, relatively worldwide. And so you get to actually uh, really see a very um, uh, international perspective as part of as part of being an astronomer which is a lot of fun it's absolutely wonderful well thank you so very much for your time um i hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and with the rest of the interviews going on and such um, but thank you so much thanks for having me on well looking at the week ahead we've got three upcoming launches the first is tonight with spacex starlink 5-15 going for its second launch attempt after a rare scrub at t-minus 40 seconds last night then on July 16th, we have Rocket Lab launching their 39th Electron rocket, carrying satellites for NASA, Telesat, and Spin Global. Rocket Lab's going to attempt to recover this Electron, and will this be the first one to get to refly? Let us know down in the comments if you think it will. And on July 18th, we have another SpaceX Starlink launch. Always gotta love another Starlink. To stay up to date on all upcoming Earth departures, head over to tlpnetwork.com launches for our TLP launch control, to, and make sure you join us live right here on the launch pad for full live launch coverage. To wrap up this week's TLP News Weekly, we're headed to Chile, where a monumental milestone has been reached in the construction of the Extremely Large Telescope, or ELT. The ELT is a collective effort by the European Southern Observatory, or ESO. ELT is now 50% complete in its construction, and once finished, it will be the largest optical and infrared telescope on Earth, enabling scientists to peer deeper into our universe, unraveling the cosmic mysteries, and unveiling celestial wonders. The physical construction of ELT started in 2014, and the ESO plans to commence scientific operations in 2028. Have a favorite story of the week? Let us know in the comments. If there's a story you think we missed, also let us know. You can also send us news tips over on Twitter or in Discord. Spaceflight is always on the rise, and you are part of this next great adventure into the stars. So subscribe so you never miss another launch live, and so you stay up to date on the latest space news. From our TLP Canada studio, my name's Zach. This was the Launchpad News, and we'll see you next time, because space is better together.